Yeah, and here we go. So I'd like to welcome everybody to our talk tonight. Um, again, we're on Zoom, which has been a wonderful thing really for us because we've been able to have a lot of artists that we might not otherwise um, be able to get to come to campus. Um, unfortunately, tonight we should have been having an opening downtown, um, but hopefully next year we'll be back to regular live openings. But um, all of our exhibitions, I tell everybody these exhibitions come to us. We have a wonderful gallery committee that meets every year with faculty. And we look at a variety of different artists that are recommended from the faculty, some outside people that um, just randomly give us submissions. Um, but I, what I love about the process the most is it's really our faculty involved with their teaching to bring artists that they think will be really good for you. So tonight um, is Jessica Mula's turn. So I'll introduce Jessica and she will introduce our artists. So Jessica. Uh, hi, I'm Jessica. Um, and. Um... I invited Britta because I teach a narrative video class that's actually running right now. So some of the people here in the audience are uh, right in the middle of learning how to make narrative videos and how to tell a story and use camera equipment and all that fun stuff. Um, but uh, to introduce you better, uh, Britta Shogren is a professor of cinema at San Francisco State University, where she launched a major initiative to spotlight the contributions of women in film. Uh, she's the author of a book on female voice and sound in film, Into the Vortex, and she co-founded the production company Dyer Wolf in 2007. I have a train going behind me that I think <laughs> <laughs> seems to be a, a true luck phenomenon. Yeah. Um, her films have received awards in diverse venues such as the Sundance Film Festival, South by Southwest, Rio Femina, Atlanta, and Aspen, and her most recent feature, Redemption Trail is a contemporary feminist Western set in nearby Oakland and Marin counties. It premiered at the prestigious Mill Valley International Film Festival, where it won the Audience Award. She is a Guggenheim Fellow, a recipient of the AFI Independent Filmmaker Grant and the Sign Reach Award. And she's programmed film series for the Craytail Festival and the Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley. She's currently developing several new projects, including an episodic fictional series developing into the issues of gun violence and gun control in the United States, as well as a limited series set in Yurok County exploring historical and contemporary water rights conflicts and their connection to the disturbing pandemic of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, and I'd like to welcome Britta. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jessica. It was very nice. Um, and um, before I start, I, I do want to just, you know, give a shout out of thanks to Dean DeCocker and to Bradley Pete Ross. I don't know if he's here tonight, but um, they were both, um, and of course to Jessica as well for suggesting me. I mean, it was, I was, uh, I was so honored and, and surprised to be invited to your, to your art space. Um, it's a, that's an unusual experience for a filmmaker and it's really been um, a lot of fun and I really appreciate Dean and Bradley um, uh, working with me, helping me curate the images and, and having such a great aesthetic sensibility along the way to, um, to make this such a, a positive experience in every, in every way. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna just uh, uh, give my sort of artist talk um, and, um, and I really look forward to, you know, hearing any questions you have. Um, it's always uh, a real privilege to get to, to talk to people, um, whether they've seen the films or not, um, um, ask me anything you like. Um, my films are unorthodox narratives that center on the subjective experience of women. My work flexes on principle against the presumption pessimistically wrought by many fem feminist film theorists <clears throat> that the powerfully, um, uh, that the powerfully centered male gaze of cinema reduces the female image and women characters of film to pure objectified spectacle. My first feature, Jojo at the Gate of Lions, highly influenced by feminist film theory and my own studies of female voice in Hollywood films of the 1940s, plumbs the potential of voice and voiceover to disrupt and reframe the image. Uh, this first of my three features is a modern Joan of Arc story about a woman who believes she can prevent nuclear war by resisting her own desires. Jojo is above all a portrait of a consciousness. 
A young woman struggles to embrace an internal divide that defines her being, a divide between a deeply felt subjective self and an equally acute experience of being objectified. To derail the seemingly inevitable objectification of the beautiful Jojo, I emphasize the many different voices telling this story. In addition to Jojo's dialogue within the scenes, her character also possesses a lyrical, poetic, asynchronous interior monologue. She also listens to another mysterious other kind of voice that the male characters in the story cannot hear, but which we as audience members hear along with her as if hallucinating together. Jojo has a voice also in writing the film through inner titles that suggest her character's retrospective view of the social and narrative conventions that have structured her life, her love affair and trials, spanning themes of love, work, death, and myth. These inner titles also speak of the filmmaker, another absent woman speaking through the film. Along with these, these acoustic strategies, exploring the dimension and psychological force of voice to disrupt, disrupt the image and align the, the spectator with Jojo's interiority. I also visually underscored Jojo's entrapment as woman slash other with a capital O in and of the cinema and as an opaque figure of mystery to the male characters in the film by using long takes and aestheticized compositions that stress Jojo's association to the image per se. The patriarchal voice of ideology itself perhaps also flows through, through this film, through the rational and coercive speech of the two men who seek to understand and or possess Jojo. Their love and violence both are linked to controlling impulses within language and, and the gaze. Thus, as the film progresses, multiple perspectives on the character of Jojo open up, offering different and sometimes irreconcilable viewpoints of her persona and situation. Complex, ambivalent, self-sabotaging. In short, not exactly a positive role model. Socially confined and mythically empowered, Jojo navigates the contradictions of being female. With a small, <clears throat> sorry, um, with a small domain and in this short life, my next two films, I continue to use sound and narrational layering to interfere productively with the image, to promote empathetic identification and to represent dissonant points of view that bring to the fore the experience and interiority of a woman or women. <clears throat> Inspired equally by the poetry of Emily Dickinson and by my friendship with Beatrice Hayes, the actress, A Small Domain, my next film, which is a short, relies almost entirely on image to tell the story of, a lonely yet vig of the lonely yet vigorous last days of a 95-year-old woman who is preparing for death. The underlying premise of the film was based on my observation of how my friend, B seemed to live in two times at once. She was keenly in the present <clears throat> and avid to drink in all that is sweet in life while also being palpably immersed in the past, very much still living with her beloved husband who was now dead for 30 years, already in a sense half dwelling in the shade. I wanted to portray this split that I saw in her to reveal her rich dimensionality, to render homage to her poignant ability to inhabit a kind of poetic vertical temporality. B's character is out of time in a sense. She also experiences the weight of time more acutely for, for her solitude. I invite the, the viewer to bear that weight, <clears throat> that weight of time for the duration of the film. I also wanted to portray the subjectivity of an elderly woman without denying her a body 
or obliterating its history of desire. Of course, where Jojo was conspicuously visible due to her youth and beauty, B is conspicuously invisible. As a quote, little old lady, she glides through public spaces, commits petty acts of theft, even kidnaps a baby without anyone really seeing her. B, like Jojo, is complicated. She's capable of drastic, unwise, troubling actions that subvert our idea of how an old woman should behave. At the end of the film, she becomes radically visible. Her bared breast, her association with an ambivalent image of sexual identity or maternity turned out to my surprise to be a taboo that outraged some viewers. And I could tell you about that later. This says a lot about how powerfully our society represses the ancient female. With a small domain, an enhanced commitment to documentary elements emerged in my work, evident in the locations, style, acting, observational camera, and other formal choices. I eschewed the self-referential elements cultivated to evoke Jojo's internality in Jojo at the Gate of Lions. Rather, with a small domain, the goal was stark simplicity, to distill the story rather than to complicate it. My next feature in this short life extended and pushed the weaving of fiction to nonfiction that I had begun with a small domain, continuing to focus not only on women, but other, also other marginalized people who rarely get to tell their story, enmeshed in lives of what T.S. Eliot called quiet desperation. Four intertwined narrative threads <clears throat> an elderly woman ambivalently embarking on an affair, a mentally unstable man being evicted from his home, a frustrated actor waiting for his big break, and a young woman at a crossroads between career and motherhood. These threads portray struggles of economic survival and existential quest. Inspired by it Italian neorealist and contemporary Iranian cinema, the film is also indebted to the films of Bresson with the, the mythic simplicity and exquisite understanding um, of how ordinary people transcend suffering in Bresson's films. The interwoven stories themselves, while conveyed in nonfiction-like style, were far from spontaneous documentations. Rather, the narrative arcs were conceived in pre-production collaboration with the subjects actors slash characters who then played themselves in roles that are largely, largely based on their real lives. Everyone involved in the production with, was both inside and outside the film simultaneously. Actors were non-actors, writers and crew were characters. As we conceived their individual stories together, drawing on both fact and imagination, our common goal was to emphasize the central themes of the film the challenges and twists of life, the difficulties of choice, the desire for personal liberty. Finally, this film was a route for me to push further into the gray zone of, of authorial voice. No longer an omniscient off-screen director, I played one of the characters. As my role as writer-director is increasingly decentered, compelling questions surfaced in the film also about my own subjectivity the authenticity of my story and my reliability as a narrator. My most recent feature, Redemption Trail, swings back into a full throttle fictionality structured by an emphatic weave of multiple voices. The stress of threading perspectives, layered, reminder, layered reminders of psychological, cultural and political difference <clears throat> honor contradictions within and between the characters in this film and their stories. The two main characters of Anna and Tess in Redemption Trail reflect my longstanding commitment to write strong, deeply internal, but by no means idealized women characters whose very imperfections connect us to their subjectivity. Ultimately, the film is a meditation 
on the possibility of recovery from trauma. Where do those who have survived deep personal loss, devastating political oppression, or who have committed irrevocable ruinous mistakes find the will to go on? What is required to reinvent our world, to reconcile with pain we do not want to remember and do not want to forget? Tess in particular with her deep emotional and political scars as the daughter of a Black Panther who was murdered in front of her. <clears throat> her invisibility as a person of color, quote unquote, and her colossal dignity, Tess seeks a freedom from the past that is perhaps ineluctably compromised by both her sex and her history. The film was inspired by such disparate influences as John Ford's The Searchers, Rossellini's films with Ingrid Bergman, feminist film theory, of course, and black exploitation picks. It was a formal, it was also a formal and thematic opportunity to reshape classic genres within a female-centric contemporary context. The film re-examines traditional classical Hollywood tropes. <clears throat> The divide between East and West, the, individual quest, the individual's quest for liberty, the shifting tides of race and class tension, and the American mythology of gun violence, and sets them into an untraditional narrative study of grief, one tempered by the affectionate lightness of a, woman's, of a woman director's riff on the spaghetti Western. I'm sorry, I got lost. Um, I just want to mention, of course, that filmmaking is a collaborative practice. Uh, the cinematographers, sound designers, editors, and actors I've worked with are essential co-artists on these films. I'm really extremely grateful for their brilliant ideas and their creative generosity in working with me. The, the photographic work that um, perhaps you saw that it, um, in this exhibit, on the other hand, is an ongoing solitary practice, one that feeds my film work as I refine my own compositional eye and aesthetic fixations. Here, perhaps obvious in my love of color, collage, compositions, the lives of women and children, the beauty of work, the grace of abstracted details, and the compelling presence in the gaze returned. <clears throat> 